Dr. Goodman, let's talk about, you know, sometimes I hear also from people saying, well, I'll wait until I get some symptoms, some signs. Is that a good idea? And then beyond that, let's talk a little bit about what some of the risk factors are for colorectal cancer. Well, I think a lot of patients are initially present or come to the, the physician when they have bleeding, and that's oftentimes the uh, initial presentation. And, um, and many people will you know, spend months saying, oh, it's my hemorrhoid. Um, and really, in, in my mind, rectal bleeding is cancer unless otherwise proven. So if there are any symptoms at that, you know, that's something that immediately should be evaluated. Um, and certainly to wait for symptoms is not the right thing to do. And as we've heard from Dr. Saltz very emphatically, um, you know, doing early detection is absolutely the best way to address this because, um, you know, and, and as he mentioned, there are studies that have shown a reduced mortality rate with colonoscopy as, as a screening method. And that's not even the case for things like PSA screening or even mammography. There's more uh, controversy about that in terms of the impact on mortality. So I think really the, um, you know, the, the absolute best way to address this is early detect or early um, detection of, of pre-cancerous lesions and that we can address. Um, and as, as we, you know, we mentioned, the, the idea is to look for polyps. And in patients that have polyps, they would be removed and then they would be evaluated on an annual basis to, until they are polyp free so that we can make sure that they can, you don't just check for polyps once and then wait 10 years. If you do have polyps, you have to go back for another colonoscopy. Um, but absolutely, I think in, in the setting of, of symptoms, if there's uh, many patients come in with um, symptoms of changes in bowel habits, changes in their stool size or caliber, um, and, and abdominal symptoms, pain, cramping, things like that, it should, you know, these are things you don't want to, um, you know, ignore for too long. But I think in particular, the bleeding is probably the most common thing, and that should really be worked up uh, immediately. It's really something that most people, I think, don't want to look down there and they don't want to deal with it, but it's, it's something that should be evaluated. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you and Dr. Saltz just came back from China where the, uh, the profile, if you will, of colorectal cancer, who's getting it, where it's being found and so forth, is changing. And I think that kind of leads us into a little bit in terms of some of the risk factors. Are there some things that are obvious risk factors and any things that we can do ourselves to minimize the chances of developing colorectal cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, in particular, I think what was interesting to us when we were there was the fact that the diet is, is changing quite a bit in China. And this may account for, although we're not, you know, obviously this has to be studied in a long-term basis and using, you know, epidemiological studies. But I think that certainly one of the big risk factors is diet. You know, high fat, low fiber diet is something that we know. And that diet is certainly changing in, in China in terms of the um, amount of Western foods that are being eaten. Um, we were impressed by the number of McDonald's and other fast food chains that have come up in Shanghai. Um, other risk factors that are very important are, is family history. If you have a family mm -hmm. history, and as, as Dr. Guillaume mentioned, the um, you know, importance of doing colonoscopy even earlier if you do have a family history, so at least 10 years earlier than the person uh, in your family that had uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so it's, it's something, is, you know, and I see quite a few young patients with rectal cancer and, um, you know, even in their 20s and 30s. So if, you, if there is any history, and those, not all of them have a family history, but if there is any family history, having an early evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think other things that we, uh, you know, diet, I think diet is probably one of the most important things that we can. High fat, high red meat diet yeah, is what puts us fat, at greatest high, risk. Low fiber. Mm -hmm, low fiber. And you mentioned family history, but I want to make sure that people don't misunderstand family history because this happens a lot with breast cancer as well. People who say, well, I don't have a family history, therefore I don't have to worry about it as much. If you've got a colon, you've got a rectum, you're at risk for colorectal cancer. Fair enough? Now tell me about uh, what else is there in, in terms of, we talked about family history, There's a, there are people who genetically make a lot of polyps, they're, they're more uh, susceptible, and, and also we, we also hear of uh, what about other gastrointestinal conditions or issues, Crohn's disease, colitis, so forth. Right, exactly. Uh, these, uh, the colitides as we refer to them, and Crohn's colitis, ulcerative colitis are the two major ones. And we believe that these are inflammatory processes, and we believe that the chronicity of the inflammatory process probably sets something off, as Lonnie points out, something at the molecular level. And there are guidelines for someone who's ha who has a history of one of these colitides to undergo uh, surveillance at a regular basis. 
Uh, and there's a debate out there between the endoscopy community and the surgical community in terms of how long should this um, screening go on in these high-risk individuals. And I would say that th there's no real definitive set of definitive data out there that uh, would justify one approach or the other. But I would highly recommend that anyone who does have a calidity to undergo regular surveillance. And uh, certainly symptoms would prompt uh, perhaps an early sur earlier surgical intervention. But these are uh, pre-malignant conditions that after a certain time, it's sort of having a, a time bomb, if you will. The clock is ticking and it started ticking 10 years ago. It's highly uh, likely that this is gonna degenerate into a form of cancer. In terms of the, the histories, uh, the people who have multiple mm -hmm. polyps, there are now very clearly defined genetic syndromes uh, for which the molecular basis is well understood. A lot more to be learned, but uh, it's understood adequately enough that we can do a genetic test, uh, a specific test. And once we have a family or an individual that meets certain criteria, the yield from these tests are quite good. Uh, it's not quite ready, as Lenny says, that you would walk into a doctor's office and say, I want the genetic family test. The yield in that situation is low at this time. But uh, in carefully selected individuals that are working with a group of counselors and genetic, uh, clinical genetics, and even your own family physician informed about these syndromes, could decide in whom the test would be most valuable and likely to yield uh, in, an important management uh, finding. Mm -hmm. So I think, I just want to emphasize one very, very important point is that should be a major red flag is that early age of onset of any cancer is a, is a, but until proven otherwise, uh, should be considered a possible suggestion of a familial form of cancer. So multiple cancers, early age of onset are usually red flags that um, suggest further investigation. And sometimes what I'm, I'm quite interested in finding is that there is always, the family history has to start somewhere. So not everybody's born with a family history, but there are cases, and I've been here long enough to see this, unfortunately, where it begins with some individual, and then five, 10 years later, uh, the, the, the word is out of the box, the family's willing to talk about it, because a lot of folks don't wanna talk about mm -hmm. this, has been pointed out. And then you begin to put the dots together, and you see, well, lo and behold, there's a tree that really might meet these criteria. Mm -hmm. But always in these criteria, Early age of onset seems to be a, a common uh, factor, common variable. That's the red flag. I think so. Yeah. So fortunately, most of these sorts of conditions we're talking about are relatively uncommon. But what about uh, something that is much more common, uh, especially as we uh, as we go, grow older, the diverticulosis or diverticulitis? Is that a risk factor, Dr. Saltz? It has not been clearly shown to be a risk factor, and I would say most likely no. I think that, Actually, tell that, us first what that is. Oh, so I mean, these these are basically clear. more benign conditions in the colon um, where you can get certain outpocketings, there, and, and those outpocketings can become uh, inflamed, but they don't seem to, as, as a rule, predispose towards cancer. I'd like to go back for just a moment to the issue of, of, of diet, because I just mm -hmm. want to comment on that, because maybe I can give you a little bit of sort of practical discussion and advice, how do we know that what we know? What, you know what, are, what is the basis for the recommendations? What do we recommend for, for people to do in terms of, of, of diet, when, either when you're hoping to avoid a cancer or when a cancer has happened? One of the things that was really interesting to look back at is the effect in Japan after World War II, uh, what I call the invasion of the two Macs, MacArthur and McDonald's, uh, <laughs> because uh, what happened is as the diet began to westernize, the incidence of colorectal cancer began to rise very, very strikingly. And when you look at Japanese people who have been uh, relocated to America, uh, who, uh, you know, who, who, who are, are now starting to eat a balance of, of, of their traditional diet and a more Americanized diet, you see an intermediate risk in terms of the cancer. So there really seems to be something in our diet and the red meat component and the refined grain component are the ones that I think would be at highest risk and where there's the most epidemiologic data. We did a, a very interesting study a couple of years ago. I ran a national trial looking at some different therapies for stage three colon cancer. And my colleagues up at Dana-Farber in, in, uh, in, in Boston, uh, Charlie Fuchs and, and Jeff Meyerhart, tacked onto that study a really important questionnaire. It was about a 37-page questionnaire where we asked patients everything about what they ate, what supplements they took, how much activity they got, and we wanted to see 
what this would mean for the long-term outcome. And it's really yielded some important and striking results. And, and uh, Jeff has been the heavy lifter in writing this stuff up and publishing it. One of the interesting findings was they took people's self-reported diets, and people had really no incentive to tell us other than accurately what they were doing, and broke it down into groups in terms of people that were eating what we would call a prudent diet versus a Western diet. And the prudent diets were diets that were high in fruits and vegetables, high in fish, relatively high in poultry, low in red meat and animal fat, and animal fat includes milk fat, and were high in whole grain and low in refined grains. When you looked in these stage three patients at the risk of the cancer coming back, the group that had the prudent diet had a very dramatic risk reduction compared to the people on the Western or the McDonald's type diet. And so it was really kind of compelling information that at all stages, diet matters. It clearly has some impact, most likely through its effect on the immune system in terms of how the body can deal with cancer. Similarly, we asked people how much physical activity they were getting, how much exercise, and broke that down into groups as well. The people that were getting the equivalent of one hour of standard pace walking per day we're not talking about training for the marathon here. We're talking about an hour of walking had a very substantial reduction in the risk of the cancer coming back compared to the people that were basically couch potatoes. And the more exercise, the, the more that was uh, the case. So simple lifestyle changes that other doctors would recommend to you, that your internist or cardiologist would want us all on, are probably appropriate for cancer maintenance and cancer prevention as well. Low in red meat and animal fat, high in fresh fruits and vegetables and fish, um, and a moderate aerobic exercise clearly makes a difference. Now, in, in these patients that you're talking about, did they go on the prudent diet after they were diagnosed and start walking after they diagnosed, or was this pre- This study was really asking the question, what are you doing three months and then six months after, your, uh, three months and then 12 months after your operation? Okay. So it didn't really look at what were the long-term issues and we don't really know to what degree people change their diets mm -hmm. versus uh, they, they, you know, people perhaps that had a healthier, more prudent lifestyle may have had something different about their reaction to the cancer at the beginning. We don't know. We have evidence that a healthy diet, as we understand it now, and again, I'm not talking about being draconian here. I'm not advocating vegan diets. I'm not advocating macrobiotic diets. In fact, I don't believe in those at all. Um, and I'm not saying meat is the root of all evil. Uh, personally, I love a good steak now and again. I just try to keep it to a minimum. Uh, once a week, once every other week is probably a reasonable target. Um, I think those are healthy lifestyle approaches that we can do that balance enjoying food because that's one of the pleasures in life. We don't want to take it away from ourselves. We don't want to take it away from patients um, and trying to maintain good health. The, the lesson there is it's never too late to make these changes. You can still no, have No, this impact. is true of people with metastatic cancer, people with earlier stage cancer, and people that don't have cancer and want to keep it that way.